Well, hello everyone. This is Al Fadi. I'd like to welcome you back to another live stream of Let Us Reason. And this one will be a brand new video series uh, on a, another important theological topic uh, that has to do with the, the doctrine of the Son of Man and how that applies to Christ in a variety of ways, obviously, including his divinity. And of course, with us here is Bruce Lee, also known as Sam Ramon. Uh, to address this important topic. Now, what prompted me really to ask Sam if he would be interested in, in talking about it is that there is this idea that are floating out there that somehow the Son of Man and Jesus are two separate, uh, you know, persons. And therefore, um, you know, people like Shabir Ali try to capitalize on things like this. Obviously, we really don't care about what's being said. We want to show what the Bible actually teaches. Yeah. So hopefully this will be edifying uh, to, to the church, the body, and glorifying to our Lord. Again, thank you for everyone for who's being here. Thank you to the moderator, <clears throat> as always. Brother, yep. welcome back, and uh, thank you for making time for us. And it's my pleasure to serve you for the sake of Jesus Christ and serve your people who come on your live stream for the glory of Jesus. So, you know, it's our habit. We need to ask the Lord to bless us. So Amen. we praise you, Father. We love you. We love your Son, the Lord Jesus. We love your Holy Spirit and depend on your spirit. <clears throat> Father, bless this session. Bless Al and myself and in union produced by your Holy Spirit. Fill us with the Holy Spirit, life from the Holy Spirit, wisdom and knowledge, understanding from the Holy Spirit for the glory of Jesus Christ and save us from error, save us from stammering and stuttering and confusion and misinterpretation. <clears throat> and please, Father, give us the health we need to serve you until it's our time to be with Jesus and fill our lungs and our chest and our throats with the breath of life, life from your Holy Spirit, the Spirit of your Son and cover us in the blood of Jesus and bless everyone who's listening to fall more in love with your word, more in love with you, with the Lord Jesus and your spirit, and take over by your spirit for the glory of Jesus. We love you, Abba. Lord Jesus, we love you. Increase on us. Holy Spirit, we need you, and we love you. Bless this session in Jesus' name. Yeah, Father, Son, and Spirit. All right. <clears throat> Amen. Amen. Yep. So let's yeah. do it, brother. All right. Well, just one thing I've noticed. People have been wondering, why am I wearing Bruce Lee T-shirts and Batman T-shirts? And where am I getting these Bruce Lee shirts and Batman shirts? I'm getting it from Amazon. Now, if you wonder why, every time I'm in the mood to destroy and decimate blasphemies, lies, and assaults against God's true word, the Holy Bible, and blasphemies against Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit, I get into Bruce Lee mode or Batman mode. So anytime I'm about to do some spiritual slaughtering, I put on a Bruce Lee shirt or a Batman shirt. Because if you guys don't know, growing up, Bruce Lee was a hero of mine, and I loved Batman. It didn't help, Al, that when I grew up, they used to call me Fat Man, okay? Don't hurt my feelings, okay? But I see some haters in your channel already saying Chuck Norris is very, better than Bruce Lee. <laughs> That's like saying Muhammad is a prophet. But anyway, with that said, may the Lord Jesus be glorified. And just to let you guys know, we've hit a nerve with Shabir Ali. Today on his Facebook page, he went live and totally, totally embarrassed himself. Guys, I want you to go on this live stream that he did on Facebook. We will be thoroughly refuting Shabir Ali. He was an embarrassment. But glory to Jesus Christ. He admitted on the live stream, and my brother Jai took notes, he's here, that he's been reading my articles and even said, he mentioned me by name and it said, because of my articles that I sent him, I have now convinced him, and he admits it, that Justin Martyr did believe and worship Jesus as Jehovah. He admits he was wrong and misusing Justin Martyr in not so many words, and he admits that my articles corrected him and exposed him, but he still went ahead and butchered the Old Testament, and he came up with questions about the Trinity that either shows he's ignorant and should not be debating or he's dishonest because the questions he asked demonstrates he does not know or cares not to know what we believe about the Trinity. For example, he says that, well, if Jesus is Job according to Justin, does that mean Jehovah has a father or that Jesus is the Trinity? Lord willing, in due course, we will be responding to his objections, showing this man should not be debating, and this man has no credibility anymore. Glory to Jesus Christ. The Lord has delivered him into our hands for the glory of Christ, and he's even on record saying he won't debate me. Now you know why. Now with that said, brother, let's talk about the Son of Man. And he's going to be watching this, by the way. He even said he's going to watch the third part in our series of original sin in the Bible versus the Quran. He said he's watched the first two parts. He's going to watch three. So, Shavira, make sure you watch this. And I'm coming after you until you repent 
and deny Muhammad and glorify Jesus Christ because Muhammad is an antichrist. Your God Allah is a false God. Turn to the true God, Jesus, your only hope of salvation. And let him know Amen. about it video discussion now amen and what i wanted to to say is like to the muslims who are listening to shabir please compare and contrast the data that we provide to you and the sources we provide to you versus someone who is doing it just based on just uh, uh you know uh, emotional argument uh, lack of uh, in-depth resources or even claiming to be an expert in it uh obviously uh, it's unfortunate you know that uh, people look up to shabir as if he is the go-to authority, in my view, uh, I'm embarrassed to say the guy doesn't even know his Arabic. So that's that's all uh, I have to oh, say. Oh, but wait! In that session, he chided you about Surah 98, verse six, because he says there's a very reading. Once one again, the, yeah, once he again. Says, the Pira'at says angels, and you should know better. Okay. Well, anyway, no, no, but that's good. That you know what that means, and we're not talking about him. It's not about Shabir, but it's about refuting lies, distortions, and blasphemies from whoever <clears throat> spews them. Shabir first and foremost. That means we're unnerving him. We're rocking his foundation. We're getting the attention of Muslims because I guarantee you the Muslims are hounding him. Look, these guys are taking you to the woodshed. They're embarrassing you. How do you respond to these objections? And the more he responds, the more he's going to dig the hole until he repents because he cannot refute the truth of Jehovah Jesus. Now, with that said, let's talk about the Son of Man. And we may have to do more than one session to deal with the objections against the Son of Man. But for those of you, right. so you can benefit... Why the Son of Man figure is important because the Son of Man appears in the Hebrew Bible. It appears in the Aramaic portion of the book of Daniel, and it supplies proof from the Hebrew Bible. Guys, pay attention to what I'm saying and invite people. Let's make this video go viral for the glory of Christ. It provides proof from the Hebrew Bible that the true prophets of God were not Unitarians. The true prophets of God believed that the one true God was multi-personal. They were Trinitarians, even though they may not have articulated the doctrine of the Trinity. They were, as even James White likes to say, experiential Trinitarians. They knew the God they worship is more than one person, even though they affirmed the unity of God. And Daniel provides proof from an Old Testament prophet that he was a Trinitarian. Now, do me a favor, brother. Let's go to Daniel. But before we go into the Son of Man, let me show you proof from Daniel Daniel, that he's a Trinitarian and was aware of the Trinity and knew it was the triune God that had raised him up for a time like that. Here, let's go to Daniel 5. I want you to do me a favor. Read. You're reading ESV, right? Uh, I am reading the New American Standard. I can go okay, to the ESV. New American Standard Bible. Say with that. That's, that's okay. Say with the New American Standard Bible. Go to Daniel 5, verse 11. Okay. Daniel 5, verse 11. Let me All show right. you the Trinity in the book of Daniel. So here is Daniel chapter 5, verse 11. It reads, There is a man in your kingdom in whom is a spirit of the holy gods, and in the days of your father, illumination, insight, and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, were found in him. Now, before you... Okay, yeah. we'll finish the point. I'm sorry. Finish it. I apologize. No problem. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, appointed him chief of the magicians, uh, conjurers, Chaldeans, and diviners. Okay, now let me explain what is being said here. They saw a hand. They saw a hand appearing right on the wall. Minni, minni, tekel parson, and they were frightened. They didn't know what it meant. None of the soothsayers, magicians, knew what it meant. So one of them said to the king, he was actually the, the acting king in place. At that time, the king was Nebuchadnezzar, but his son, Belshazzar was acting king of police because Nebuchadnezzar had gone on a journey to worship the moon god, right? Because he used to worship the moon god, and moon god worship was prevalent in Arabia. You know, coincidence, right? But anyway, Belshazzar, yeah. so they come up to him saying, look, Belshazzar, there's this wise man who has been giving counsel and interpreting visions and dreams from the time of Nebuchadnezzar, your father, meaning your, your ancestor, right? Because his father was Nebuchadnezzar. This man has the spirit of the gods, holy gods in him. Now, there's a debate. Should the Aramaic word, because this part of Daniel is written in Aramaic. Should the Aramaic word, Elahin, be translated plural or singular? Should it be a spirit of the holy God in him or a spirit of the holy gods? 
However you decide to translate, and Lord willing, we can go in-depth in future sections on this, and I can do it on my own YouTube channel. However you want to render it, if they're saying that the spirit of the holy gods are in him, that would reflect their pagan outlook. But notice what they are stating. There is a divine spirit in him, a divine spirit that enables him and gives him illumination to know dreams and their interpretation. So you see, here you have an affirmation of the Holy Spirit operating in and through Daniel, enabling Daniel to know dreams and mysteries that no one else knows and no other God is able to know because the gods of the heathens are false. Did you get, you guys got that? The spirit of the holy gods is in him. It should be, in my estimation, the spirit of the holy God. But now let's see what Belshazzar says to Daniel in Daniel 5, 14. All right. So we're going to go to Daniel 5, verse 14. Now I have heard about you that a spirit of the gods is in you and that illumination, insight, and extraordinary wisdom have been found in you. Mm. Did you see what it is? I have heard your reputation precedes you. A spirit of the gods. Now, again, should it be a spirit of the gods or the spirit of God, Elahim? And again, I will give proof it should be God. That's why the King James, well, no, no, I'm sorry. That's why when this word Elahim is used in the King James other parts, they translate it as God, not gods. But anyway, that whether you want it gods or God, the point still stands. Guys, notice. The pagans recognize the spirit is in Daniel. Now, whether they think it's their God sending their spirit to him or Daniel's God, it's irrelevant for this discussion. What is relevant is they're aware the spirit indwells Daniel, empowers Daniel, and gives Daniel illumination. Yet, yeah, Elah is the base form in Jean. It's plural in Aramaic. It's Elahin, Elahin, the masculine suffix in. Yes, you're looking at the base form. It's Elahim. But be that as it may, they recognize the spirit is in him. The spirit is given illumination, understanding to know things that no other individual is able to know. No soothsayer, diviner, diviner, and no other God because the gods are false. So here you see the Holy Spirit in the book of Daniel. And what does the Holy Spirit do? What he always does, inspire prophets and apostles and enable them and empower them to know mysteries that are beyond human ability to discover, let alone know. Is that you can see that? So there's the Holy Spirit. Now let's go to Daniel 3 25. When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are thrown into the fire, Shadrach, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are thrown into the fire. I'm glad you did that, Sam, because I was preparing that to show also how Nebuchadnezzar's response was. Yes, yes, yes. Now, when okay. Daniel 3.25, when you get there, watch here. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego are thrown in the fire. Here, the King James and the New King James translates the Aramaic correctly in my estimation. It should be that there's four men in the fire, and they're unhinged. The fire doesn't consume them. And the fourth one has the appearance of the son of Elahim, which the New American Standard Bible renders as son of the gods, right? Okay. Right. Can you read it for me? All right. So we're going to read it again. So this is uh, Nebuchadnezzar's reaction. He's saying, he said, look, I see four men loosed and walking about in the midst of the fire without harm. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. This is the new American standard. Now I'm going to show you why it shouldn't be translated that way in a minute. But now who is this fourth man? Notice the fourth man looks like a man. He has a human appearance. He looks human. But he's more than that. There's something about his appearance that signifies to those looking at him. Though he appears as a man, he's more than a man because he looks like the son of God. Who is this one that appears as a man along three other men, though he's not human by nature, but his appearance is such that when you look at him, you know he's more than human. He's the son of God. Who is he? Daniel 3 verse 28. Daniel 3 verse 28. We're going to go to Daniel 3, verse 28, and uh, verse 28 reads, Nebuchadnezzar responded and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who put their trust in him. 
violating uh, uh, violating the king's commands and yielded up their bodies so as not to serve or worship any god except their own god. Now notice, it's not the Holy Spirit, Helen. And by the way, my mom's name was Helen. The Lord Jesus bless you. It's the angel of God. Here you have one of the passages that identify the angel of God as the son of God who appears as a man. So catch it. The angel of God is the son of God sent to deliver the people of God and the angel of God appears as a man. Sound familiar? The angel of God who's God's messenger is the son of God sent to deliver the people of God and he appears as a man. The New Testament. Jesus is the son of God sent by God to be his messenger and the savior of God's people who not only appears as a man, but became man. So everyone with me there? Did you guys get it? I want you to make sure you're getting it. God, his angel, who is his son, and the Holy Spirit. God, his angel, who is his son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, how do I know that in Daniel 3, 25, the Aramaic should be rendered the son of God, not the son of gods. The son of God, not the son of gods. Because the Aramaic is plural, ilahim. Let me show you why many of your translations drop the ball and will confuse you. Notice why Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown in the fire. They were thrown in the fire, as Nebuchadnezzar said in 28, because they told Nebuchadnezzar, we will not serve any other god. We won't serve your gods or worship your image. We will serve our god alone. Now, that's why Nebuchadnezzar got angry and threw him in the fire. So if Nebuchadnezzar knows that the reason why they would rather be consumed by the fire and die is because they won't worship my gods or serve and worship my image, does it make sense for him to then say, look, the fourth man looks like a son of the gods? What do you mean son of the gods? What do you mean son of the gods? You know, Nebuchadnezzar, that they're not worshiping your gods or your image. They only worship their God, and they're convinced their God is the only true God. Why would you say a son of the gods came to save them when the gods wouldn't save them but condemn them? Right? So that's why the King James gets it right. The New King James gets it right. If you go to the King James, New King James, that Aramaic is rendered in English as, and the fourth one has the appearance of the Son of God. There you go. God, the angel of God, who's the son of God, and the spirit of God. That's the Trinity in Daniel. So Daniel is a Trinitarian who's aware of the triune God and loves and worships the triune God. He knows he's empowered by the spirit of God to know mysteries and their interpretation. And he knows that the angel of God is the son of God who appears as a man who's sent to deliver the people of God. All in Daniel. Brother, you with me there? Absolutely. And uh, to the moderators, uh, by the way, flip the switch. I did flip the switch on him and he's on timeout right now. All right. Okay, good. So get it, guys. Who would have thunk it? Now, with that said, we're going to go to the Son of Man figure. First of all, let's go to Daniel 7, verses 9 to 10. Daniel 7. All right. And by the way, before I move on, someone may ask, well, how would Nebuchadnezzar know that the angel of God is the Son of God? He wasn't a monotheist. You know how he know? How he knew? Because of the witness of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. Do you think that Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, who are in the palace of the king, who are doing things that are miraculous, that are blowing the mind of the king and his <clears throat> court, because they exhibit a revelation and a knowledge illumination that even Nebuchadnezzar's sorcerers and chanters and diviners are not able to even match because their gods are false. You think they're not preaching to them who the God of Israel is? You think they're not telling Nebuchadnezzar, our God is the true God and all gods bow to him and our God has his angel who is his son and the spirit that empowers us? That's how he would know because of their witness because they are witnessing, they're preaching to the pagans, their God is true, not your God, so worship our God. And at the end of Daniel 4, Nebuchadnezzar repents and worships the God of Daniel. He becomes a true believer at the end of Daniel chapter 4. Now, with that said, let's go to Daniel 7, verses 9 to 10. Daniel right. 7, verses 9 to 10. And by the way, guys, uh, um, 
Protestant believer already because he is saved before all of us. Uh, he put the verses in there already. He's a good man. All right. Uh, pro, uh, you know, uh, Daniel 7, verse 9, 10, verse 9. I kept looking until thrones were set up and the ancient of days took his seat. His, uh, his vesture was like white snow and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was ablaze with flames. Its wheels were a burning fire. Verse 10. A river of fire was flowing and coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands were attending him, and myriads upon myriads were standing before him. The court sat and the books were opened. Now, if you are an attentive, astute reader, because remember, guys, let me exhort you by the grace and the power of the Holy Spirit. It's not enough to read the Bible. You have to read it with depth, meditate and understand it, and ask the Holy Spirit to remove the veil so you can plunge the depth of Scripture to know it and then live it out by the power of the Spirit for the glory of Christ. So if you were listening, Daniel saw thrones, plural, thrones, plural. And he saw a figure called the Ancient of Days seated on one throne because he describes the wheels of that throne that the Ancient of Days sat upon. And he says the Ancient of Days appeared in visible form, in visible shape. He had a white robe and white hair like wool on his head. So here's the Ancient of Days appearing as an older person. Invisible form, visible shape, white robe, white hair, visibly seated on one throne. Yep, John Beetle, you got it. That's who it is, the Father appearing visibly. So if there's thrones, but Ancient of Days sits on one of them, that means there's another throne for someone else, the, another throne for another occupant. Who is that other throne for? Same book, Daniel 7, verses 13 and 14. Yes, let's read that. Verse 13, I kept looking in the night visions and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. And he came up to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which will not pass away. And his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. Okay, guys, before I unpack this, I'm going to give you links to my blog posts. I have multiple articles on the Son of Man of Daniel, refuting the objections by people like Shabir and other Unitarians, and on the worship given to the Son of Man. So here is link number one. And I'm going to send it to him. He'll put it in the description box as well. Yes. Click on the link. You're going to see a series of articles about the Son of Man. There's the link. Can you guys click on it or no? I'm not so what? sure. Sometimes they say they cannot see it, brother. But uh, you, you'll send it to me and I'll Can make sure. Do you guys see the link or no? If the mods see it, do me a favor, mod. Copy and paste it and repost it because the mods should be able to see it and post it. Right. That's link number one. Here's the other link. Everything I'm about to discuss will be in these articles with greater depth. And you have my permission to print them out or upload to your website. So even make YouTube sessions just using the material. Spread the information disseminated for the glory of Jesus. These are in for you guys. Okay. You guys see the link? No one's responding. And none of the mods are saying anything. We need to start blocking the mods. Yeah. Moderators, I'm going to give you like five seconds to respond to us or we're going to be blocking yeah, they're you. Not, yeah. They're not seeing it. So L Longinus of Jerusalem, do you mods see the links? If you do... Then, you, okay, you guys are a bunch of lovers. I was going to say those. Okay, hold on. All right, the links didn't come through. So, oh, uh, man, okay. All right, I'm going to have to go on Discord and send it to Protestant, and he can post it. But anyway, with that said, notice what Daniel 7, Daniel 7, 13 and 14 said. He goes, in the night I had a vision, one like a son of man riding the clouds of heaven. I guys want you to go back. I want you to go back and look at it again. And it says, and he came to the ancient of days. He came to the ancient of days. You guys catching it? Ancient of days. All right. Notice that's two. Do the math. That's two. The ancient of days and the son of man. The son of man is not the ancient of days. And <clears throat> the ancient of days is not the son of man. I want to... Sound like a broken record until it sinks in. How many? Two. 
son of man and ancient of days. So that means when Daniel saw, when Daniel saw thrones, more than one, the thrones are for the ancient of days and the son of man. Oh my goodness. Daniel sees two figures sitting on two thrones showing they're two different persons. They're not the same person. That's the first point. The second point, it says the Son of Man rides the clouds of heaven. And thirdly, he's an eternal king whom all nations, all tribes and languages must worship, must serve. And that verb serve, pilach in Aramaic, is the type of service given to God alone. Given to God alone. So notice the three points about the Son of Man. The Son of Man is not the Ancient of Days. He approaches the Ancient of Days and he occupies the other throne. The Son of Man rides the clouds of heaven and he is served by all nations forever as he rules over them forever. Every nation, tribe and tongue, must serve the Son of Man. That means all the Muslim nations, Shabir Ali, Shabir's God and Shabir's prophet who's now in hell, they must worship the Son of Man because he owns them and he rules over them. Now let me show you why. This son of man is God appearing as a man. How do I know this son of man is not a creature, but God appearing as a man, even though he's not the ancient of days? I know it for two facts. He rides the clouds of heaven. Now, let me show you from the Bible, specifically the Hebrew Bible, riding the clouds of heaven is something that only God does. And even the ancient Near Eastern people, the ancient Near Eastern peoples, the pagans knew that riding the clouds was a function of deity. Only gods, goddesses, rode clouds. For example, in Canaanite mythology, and I need you to listen to this. Canaanite mythology, the false god Baal, Baal, whom they took to be the son of Il, Baal was known as the cloud rider, the rider of the clouds. So even the pagans knew riding the clouds was something that only a divine being does. According to the Old Testament, only the true God rides the clouds of heaven. Let me prove it to you. Brother, if you don't mind, go to Psalm 68, verse 4. Psalm 68, verse, verse 4. And Protestant just posted the links for you guys because I sent it to him in Discord. Hopefully he posted it. Repost them a couple more times, brother. There are two links. Okay. Psalm 68, verse 4. All right, we're going to read it right now. Psalm 68, verse 4. Sing to God, sing praises to his name, lift up a song for him who rides through the deserts. Now, the Hebrew also, there's a variant. It's who rides through the heavens, but that's fine. He rides through the desert. How does he ride through the deserts? When he rides through the deserts, what does he ride on when he rides through the deserts? Finish it, and I'm going to show you. Uh, whose name is the Lord and exalt before him. Okay, now, same chapter, Psalm 68, same chapter, same chapter. We're going to read 63, but also include 64. The answer right. is 63, but we want to read also 64. Uh, you mean verse 63? What do you want? Psalm 63? And of course, Psalm 68, verse, wait, I'm sorry. 43. I apologize. See, this is what you do. You're playing with my mind, dude. It's Psalm 68, 43. The answer is in 43, but at 44. So it's Psalm 68. 43, 44, too many sixes in my mind, like 666. Come on, man. It's so, your fault. Whenever I make a mistake, it's your fault and Protestant's fault. All right. So it's it's my fault. I have verses 34 and 35, the last two verses. So yeah. it, Psalm 68, that's... 33 and 34. What's there you wrong? Go. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me focus. Lord Jesus, help me to focus. Help me not Amen. to miscount <laughs> Okay, now I re I rebooted the computer. Psalm 68, 33. Is the answer, and at 34, it goes with verse 4. So again, Psalm 68, verse 4, 33, 34. I shut down because of the 60 and the verse 4. So I made the mistake of saying 63 and 40. Right. Right. It's your well, fault. Read. Mistake, sinner. Verse, verse 33. To him who rides upon the highest heavens, which are from ancient times, behold, he speaks forth with his, with his voice, a mighty voice. Ascribe strength to God. His majesty is over Israel and his strength is in the skies or the so heavens. When, basically, yeah. When, when in verse four, it says he rides through the desert. 
In 33 of Psalm 68, how does he ride through the deserts? Desert? Yeah, it says in 33 that to him who rides upon the highest heavens. So he rides the heavens through the deserts. You catch yeah. it? So who rides the clouds of heaven? Who rides on the heavens through the deserts? Jehovah the Lord. Psalm 104. Now go to Psalm 104, verse, verse 2. Psalm 104, verses 2 and 3. The verse is verse 3, but read 2 and 3 together. Psalm 104, verse 3, as the Lord Jesus enables me to call, recall these facts, but read 2 as well. Okay. Did I lose you? Uh-oh, I lost sound. Is it me or is it him? I don't hear anything anymore. Can you guys hear me? Can you hear me? No, I heard. What happened, dude? What did you do? All right. Um, uh, Psalm 104, verse 2. Covering okay. yourself this with light. This verse is going to be in 3. So Psalm 104, verse 2, but it's in verse 3. 2 and 3. Go ahead. Now he had it. Go ahead. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to start with 2. Covering yourself with light as with a cloak, stretching out heaven like a tent curtain. He lays the beams of his upper chambers in the waters. He makes the clouds his chariot. He walks upon the wings of the wind. He makes the winds his messengers, flame and fire. Four. Now you went to verse four. It's okay. You went to verse four. The key verse was three. Psalm 104, verse three. But I wanted him to read verse two. Who clothes himself with light as a garment? Who wears light as his clothing? In verse two? The Lord. The Lord, right? Who then yeah. makes the clouds? The ch his chariots in verse 3? The Lord. So notice, the Lord Jehovah, pay attention, because we're going to come back to this. By the grace of Jesus Christ, as he perfects our ability to recall scriptures and not have a shut now, we're going to come back to this. The Lord Jehovah wears light as a garment. He clothes himself with light. The Lord Jehovah rides the clouds as his chariot. Don't forget that. Because it's going to be relevant to the Son of Man being Jesus Christ. Keep that in mind. That was Psalm 104, 2 to 3. Isaiah 19, verse 1. Isaiah 19, verse 1. All right. Isaiah 19. Verse 1. Okay, verse 1. The oracle can in Egypt, Behold, the Lord is riding on a swift cloud and is about to come to Egypt. The idols of Egypt will tremble at his presence, and the heart of the Egyptians will melt within them. Did you catch it? Who's going to ride a swift cloud to come to judge Egypt? The Lord Jehovah. He's riding on a swift cloud. The clouds are his chariot. He rides through the heavens, through the desert. Who? The Lord Jehovah. Final one. Nahum, the book of Nahum. Nahum, chapter 1, verse 3. Exactly, Andrew Martin. My style is like Bruce Lee. It's Jeet Kundo offensive. The best defense is a good offense. Okay. Now, Nahum, chapter 1, verse 3. All right, verse 3. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and the Lord will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. In whirlwind and storm is his way, and clouds are the dust beneath his feet. Now, I can give you more verses, but you saw the evidence, right? Jehovah, the true God, the Lord Yahweh, he rides the clouds as the dust beneath his feet. <clears throat> He's the one who rides the heavens through the deserts, and he comes on a swift cloud to judge, and he clothes himself with light. He wears light as clothing. Keep that in mind. So what does the Son of Man do? The Son of Man rides the clouds of heaven, something that God does. The second thing about the Son of Man, in Daniel 7, 14, did you notice? It says all nations, not some. That's right. Tribes and peoples, all human beings, yeah, everywhere, all Muslims, everyone who's a human creature is to serve the Son of Man, give the Son of Man service as he reigns over them forever. So the Son of Man is an eternal king with an eternal kingdom whom all nations, all, all languages, all tribes must worship. Now, the word serve in Daniel 7, 14, guys, pay attention. That's in the articles I sent Protestant to post in the link. He just posted them. Click on the articles. 
read them, save them, use them, upload them to your to your websites, make YouTube sessions, you know, distribute them for the glory of Jesus. All this information is there. The word serve in Aramaic is pilach. I'm going to trans transliterate. Pilach. This verb in Daniel refers to the worship that must be given to God alone. This verb is used for the worship that must be given to God alone and cannot be given to someone else. Let me show you how this word pilach is used. And yet the Son of Man re receives pilach. I already transliterated, and you guys are already misspelling it. It's stuck for the law. Timmy, Timmy, pilach, right there, guys. But it's Protestant believer who decided to misspell it for you in English to deceive people like Zoo. Ah, oh, Protestant, what are we going to do with you? All right, pilach, one more time. Here you go. Okay. Let me show you that this verb in Daniel always refers to the worship that's to be given to God alone. You can't give it to someone else. Go to Daniel 6, 16 if you can for me, brother. Daniel 6. 16, verse 16. Now that's 616. Okay, we're not going to get confused now. Okay, Daniel chapter 6, verse 16. It reads, Then the king gave orders, and Daniel was brought in and cast into the lion's den. The king spoke and said to Daniel, Your God, whom you constantly serve, will himself deliver you. Now, you guys catch what the king said to Daniel? Your God, whom you constantly serve. It's the same verb, pilach. Daniel serves his God and no other. That's the same verb, guys. Daniel 6, verse 20. Daniel 6, verse 20. Okay, we're going to read verse 20. Verse 20 reads... When he had come near the den to Daniel, he cried out with a troubled voice. The king spoke and said to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you constantly serve been able to deliver you from the lions? And he did, obviously. But now notice, guys, pay attention. You see what the king said? The God that you're constantly serving, serve. Guess what the verb is? Pilach. Are you guys understanding the point? Daniel only gives service. He only serves the true God, no one else. You're catching it? Now, who saved Daniel from the mouths of the lions from being consumed? Read verse 22, brother. Daniel 6, 22. Watch here. All right. Uh, uh, Castellers, uh, thank you so much for uh, your super chat. Uh, 6, verse 22. 6, verse 22. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth and they have not uh, harmed me wait in there's the angel again read right. it one more time who would he send yeah my god sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth and they have not harmed me in as much as i was found innocent before him and also towards you O king i have committed no crime guys did you catch it the angel of the lord who is the son of god that appears as a man, saved Daniel from the lion's den as he saved Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego from the fire. There he is again, that same angel. But now remember what it said about the Son of Man. The Son of Man rides the clouds of heaven, something that God does. All nations, tribes, and languages will serve him. And that word serve refers to the worship given to God alone. And his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Now read verse 26, Daniel 6, 26. Whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom? All Daniel right. 6, 26, because we're going to have to do a part two on this, obviously. Absolutely. Uh, verse six, uh, Chapter 6, verse 26. I make a decree that in all the dominion of my kingdom, men are to fear and tremble before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God and enduring forever, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed and his dominion will be forever. Okay, so God's kingdom is one that won't be destroyed, and his dominion is forever. Let's reread Daniel 7, 14. The son of man who comes on the clouds, does he receive this service? Is he served like God and his kingdom, an indestructible one like God's kingdom? Daniel 7, verse 14. Watch here. Very good. Verse 14. And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom, that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. 
His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. Wow. Why is it that Daniel is ascribing the very worship to the Son of Man from all nations and, and tribes and languages and describes the kingdom of the Son of Man the same way the true God is worshipped and the same way the true God is described as reigning over an indestructible dominion? Why is it the Son of Man is being spoken of the same way God is being spoken of? And yet the Son of Man is not the Ancient of Days. Hmm. Now, final examples of the word serve being used for God alone. You are to serve God and no one else. You can't serve any other divine being but the true God. Daniel 3, verse 12, when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to worship the image, the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar had fashioned, his subjects went to Nebuchadnezzar and complained about them. So in Daniel 3, verse 12, what did they say? Daniel 3, verse 12. All right, Daniel 3, verse 12. Verse 12 reads, There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the administration of the province of Babylon, namely Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have disregarded you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image which you have set up. They don't serve what? The golden image. No, that's they don't worship the golden image. They don't serve what? Um, give me a second here. See, I caught uh, you. It's okay. I, it's all right. I see. I'm always, always, I'm always on, on your case to make you sharp. They, so you don't, they do not serve your gods. Okay. Did you guys see the verb? It says in Aramaic, and they're complaining of an Ezra. They do not serve Pilach, your gods. So then in verse 14, what does Nebuchadnezzar say to them? Verse 14, Nebuchadnezzar responded and said to them, is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? So you don't serve my gods. You don't give pirach to my gods. No, because notice their response now. Daniel 3, same chapter, 17, 18. Notice what they say to him. They now respond and answer. All right. Uh, verse uh, uh, 16 and uh, 17, 18. Yes, it's same chapter, Daniel 3, 17, 18. Verse same 17. Yep. Very good. Uh, verse 17. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire. Did you catch it before you move on? Our God whom we serve, our God whom we give pilach to, can save us from the fire so the fire doesn't consume us because he's almighty. But now notice the attitude of faith. Look what they say next. Keep reading. All right. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Did you guys catch it? By the way, we got some dogs and demons manifesting like our talk block. This guy, by the way, just so I know, he's got serious mental health issues and he's demonized. He, he stalks me after I've already schooled him, refuted him, and I got it on my YouTube channel. He doesn't Which, understand basic logic or comprehension, and yet, like a dog, he keeps stalking me. Which guy? Him is our talk block, but he's gone. Glory to Jesus Christ. He is already exposed on YouTube. May he repent. But, man, the dude just is a stalker. He stalks me like a madman, like a scorned lover. Dude, I don't want you. Go find someone else. I'm already taken. Jesus is my mm -hmm. husband. And I'm part of the spiritual bride. Now, with that said, guys, did you read Daniel 3, 17, 18? Pay attention. Pay yep. attention to what you read. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego said to Nebuchadnezzar, the God whom we serve, the God who alone we give pilach to, will save us from the fire because he's almighty over the fire and creation. But in case he doesn't, notice the attitude of faith. Notice the attitude of faith. But he, he may choose not to save us. He may allow us to be burned by the fire, to die as martyrs for his glory. And in case he doesn't, let it be known, even if you throw us in the fire and the fire consumes us, we will not serve your gods or worship your image. So are you getting the picture? Are you getting the picture? This word, sir, pilach, can only be given to God. You cannot give it to any other god. That would be blasphemy. And Amen. so... 
Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego refused to give Pilaf to any other god but their own. And what did God do to honor them in the sight of the pagans? To show the pagans that he alone is God. He alone is worthy of Pilach, not their gods. He then delivered them out of the fire by sending his son, the son of God, who's the angel of God, appearing as a man, to save them from the fire, consuming them, walking in the fire as if they were in a pond or in a lake, unharmed, unhinged, and bringing them out as a miraculous testimony. The God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, he alone is God and worthy of Pilach, no one else. And that's why Nebuchadnezzar broke out in praise in Daniel 3.28. Watch here. In Daniel 3.28. And I, I want to thank uh, Catholico for uh, uh, your super chat. Uh, Sister uh, Sarah Hawass, amen. We want the Muslims to repent. And by the way, uh, you look like an Arab. So, Rabbi Barkik, shukran ala, ala ta'abik. Okay, so Daniel. Daniel 3.28. Watch right. now Nebuchadnezzar's confession because of the miracle that the true God performed in saving his servants. Verse 28, Nebuchadnezzar responded and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who put their trust in him, violating the king's command and yielded up their bodies so as not to serve or worship any god except their own god. You see the verb again, serve? They refuse to serve, Pilach, any other god but their own. So guys, help me understand this. How then could God allow Daniel to see in a vision a human figure riding the clouds of heaven, coming to the Ancient of Days, receiving a kingdom and a throne to rule over all creation, where all creatures give this son of man, Pilach, the worship that Daniel says is to be given to God alone? Who is this son of man that rides the clouds as God does and receives the same worship that God alone is supposed to receive? a service and a worship not to be given to any other God. Who is that son of man? And yet he's not the ancient of days. Wow. So did you catch what you're reading in Daniel? Two thrones, ancient of days is on one throne. He appears in a visible shape, visibly seated on a throne. The throne is visible. He's visible, white robe, white hair. And then another visible figure, one who looks human, coming on the clouds, approaching him, and sitting on the other throne. You understand what you just read? By the Holy Spirit indwelling Daniel, Daniel saw the Ancient of Days and the Son of Man visibly in a vision. And if the Son of Man is not the Ancient of Days, and I'm going to show you that it's Jesus Christ, then guys, let this shock you. Many of you already know this because you already were commenting. You saw this. Daniel saw, because of the Holy Spirit indwelling him, God the Father appearing visibly in visible shape with a white robe, white hair, seated visibly on a throne, and Jesus Christ as the Son of Man. He saw the Father and the Son. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And folks, uh, it's been at least 48 minutes, and Sam is unpacking just in the book of Daniel at least three chapters with a heavy focus on chapter 7, as he should, of course. And yet we have someone like Shabir Ali who claims to know what the Bible teaches and just does like a, a one pass on something and makes it sound like he has refuted what the scripture teaches. No wonder we don't take him seriously. Yep. Now, let me let me in this first part, because we're going to do multiple parts, show you that the Son of Man is Jesus. So you have the Old Testament, Daniel proving God is multipersonal. And one of the persons of God, one of the persons of God, the Son of Man, is later identified in the New Testament as Jesus Christ. So let me show you that that Son of Man that Daniel saw is Jesus Christ. Now let's Amen. go to Mark 14, 61 and 62. Mark 14, 61 and 62. VJ, uh, thank correct, you so much. Let me for... correct this other guy. Hold on now. Let me correct this person. I think he's an ignoramus, uh, either because he's trying to refute me or he's asking. His name is Mikalis. Now, because, again, I don't want to call him stupid because I don't want to insult stupid people. He thinks that in Revelation 1, that there Jesus is said to be the Son of Man who looks like the Ancient of Days, so that he thinks that in Daniel 7, that Ancient of Days is not the Father. Michalis, let me know when I should block you, before I embarrass you or after I embarrass you by showing you you don't know the Bible and then block you. What should I do first? Please go ahead and show him first. Okay. In Revelation 1, 
Jesus is the son of man who looks like the ancient of days because he is the ancient of days in that he's just as old as his father. The term ancient of days is a divine title that denotes the fact that the Godhead is eternal and uncreated. Therefore, Jesus can be called the Ancient of Days, and the Father can be called the Ancient of Days, and the Spirit can be called Ancient Days, because the Ancient Days means that they're very old because they're eternal. They've always existed. But now you show you're a heretic, a modalist, a son of Satan, because if you're saying that Jesus is the Ancient of Days of Daniel 7, then that means Jesus is the Father and the Son. He's appearing in two different modes. So right. Jesus is not the Son of the Father. He is the right. Father and the Son. You're a modalist and a heretic, not a Trinitarian, and therefore a son of the devil. Yeah, he's probably a Unitarian. It's obvious. Okay, let me try this again. You're no John Chrysostom, and you're not worthy to lick John Chrysostom's feet. But John Chrysostom is still a human being, and I'm not on his level. But when Scripture says you're a heretic and son of the devil, John Chrysostom would be with me condemning you. So, Michalis, I'm going to let you answer the question real quickly before we get you blocked. In Daniel 7, the Son of Man comes to the Ancient of Days. Son of Man comes to the Ancient of Days. He's not the Ancient of Days. Are you saying that in Daniel 7, Jesus is the Ancient of Days and the Son of Man? So that Jesus is coming to himself in a different mode, a different manifestation. Please say that because then that means you're a heretic, not a Trinitarian, a son of the devil, a satanic dog. Say it, please, so we can block you. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. We have we have Jeopardy music, Michaelis. You have you have five seconds to expose yourself. And do not say you're Orthodox because you're a disgrace to the Orthodox Church, and the Orthodox would condemn you as a heretic. Okay, so you notice I changed the subject. What does Daniel 10 got to do with Daniel 7? Ancient of days is one, and the Son of Man is another who comes to the Ancient of days. Send this guy to the Muslims because he's better off being a Muslim than he is a so-called Christian. Okay? And now with that said, did everyone understand response to this heretic who thought he's smart and who would have the audacity to appeal to a great man like John Chrysostom, Golden Mouth? How dare you mention a Trinitarian who would condemn you as a heretic, a son of the devil? For the rest of you, you understand that in Daniel 7, the Son of Man can't be the Ancient of Days. Because let's read it one more time, Daniel 7, 13, in case they missed it. All right. Daniel 7, verse 13. Yes. And uh, Now you guys see why I'm wearing my Bruce Lee shirt? I'm going to get Bruce Lee on you and take you out. Because Bruce Lee's policy was knock someone out in three seconds, take them out, no no prisoners. That's what I'm going to do to you spiritually. G can do you spiritually, take you out for the glory of Jesus. Now, all right, Daniel folks. Uh, we, uh, this is our disclaimer. Uh, Sierra International Channel is not responsible for yes. any injuries. <laughs> yeah. All right. Now, let's read Daniel right. 7. Pay attention again. Verse 13. I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming, and he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. I mean, yeah, clearly, confused. Sam, two distinct persons. Okay, but that's where you're confusing me. According to this fake heretic who appealed to John Chrysostom, Jesus is son of man in the Ancient of Days. Did you read it? The son of man came near to the Ancient of Days and was brought into his presence. Could it be any clearer? The Son of Man in Daniel 7 is not the Ancient of Days. He is distinct from the Ancient of Days. So then why in Revelation 1? Because I know what this heretic is referring to. He thinks that I don't know Revelation 1. I was born yesterday. I keep telling everyone, Al, they don't get it. I'm not born yesterday. I was born the day before, two days ago, not yesterday. I already know these objections. I use Revelation 1 to show that the Son of Man is also the Ancient of Days. Even though in Daniel 7, the Son of Man is not the Ancient of Days there. The Ancient of Days in Daniel 7 is the Father, and the Son of Man is his Son. But in Revelation 1, Jesus is called the Son of Man, and he's described as the Ancient of Days. Why? Not because he's the Father, but because like the Father, he is ancient. Like the Father, he is old. How old? He's eternal and timeless, so the Father can be called the Ancient of Days. So can the Son and the Spirit, because all three of them are the Ancient of Days, because all three of them are eternal, because they're the one God. Hello. Hello. Hello, my friend. Hello. All right. 
we have a few more minutes to show that Jesus on a man. We're going to do a part two. We got a good crowd. We have over 360. Next thing I want about I want to see about yeah. 800. Anyway. So Go ahead, brother. Sam, if I may ask, I mean, uh, in light of what you just mentioned, and, and uh, Atur S., thank you so much. God bless you. Uh, you mentioned something that he is given a description to the father as the ancient of days. And then when it came to the son, he said something interesting. Someone like, like Kever, Kever Anish, you know. So so why was he saying it this way? Yeah, that was, a, we, we were going to answer that later, but I'll answer now because you're very funny. You just want to, you know, anyway, why is he said to be one like a son of man? You know why? Because if you see one who's a son of man, let me explain this question. And then we got it. We're not ending it until I show it's Jesus, heretic. Okay. Got to show it's Jesus. So let me come back. Are you muted again or can you hear me? I can what? hear you. Oh, man, because you're scaring me. Last time you were muted, I can hear you. Okay. Now, why does it say, Ke bar inash? Ke like. Ke bar inash. The word is bar inash. It's Aramaic. Those of you who son speak of. Syrian, say it again. Yeah, son of. Yeah. Why don't you cut me off another three times, heretic? Go ahead. Uh, well, here you go. There you go. Ke bar inash. Bar inash. It's Aramaic. Bar inash. I'm waiting for you to cut me off. Son of man. Bar means son, and inash means man. Okay. Why does it say one like a son of man? Okay, there's a Syrians here who speak Syriac. We have a similar term, Barnasha. Barnasha. Okay, what does Barnasha mean in modern Syriac and what does it mean in Aramaic at the time of Daniel? Bar Inash, Barnasha means human. If I say to this guy, look, Ziawa Barnasha, I'm saying, look at this guy, look at this man. So when you see a Bar Inash, he's saying, I'm cutting off. Am I cutting off, guys? Now we're really getting distracted by the devil. You're not. You're not, okay, you're so not cutting off. Okay, guys. Hey, can someone block Protestant believer? Can we get this loser out of here? Because he said I'm getting cut off. Okay, now coming back to the issue. Lord Jesus, be glorified in our midst. Woo, talk about distractions today. Timmy. All right, now let's focus. I got ADD, brother. You're, you're, you're making it worse than it is. For those of you who are not going to be a distraction, but listen. Those of you who are listening and not being a distraction so we can finish it in time so you guys can get the point. The word bar inash is simply Aramaic for someone that's a man. So when you see a bar inash, you're seeing what you think is just a man. Just a man. No more, no less. The reason why Daniel is saying, I saw one like a son of man is because he's trying to emphasize the fact that though he appears as a man, he's more than a man. So don't think he's only a man. He's more than a man. He's God in human appearance. That's why like a son of man, because he's not just a man. He's more than a son of man. He's God appearing as a man. That's why he uses the phrase. Everyone with me there? Everyone get it? Thanks, brother. I just wanted to clarify this, and I know you're going to visit it again. No, I will have to because that comes up with Shabir Ali, by the way. Yeah. Shabir Ali brings up that ob objection. It's similar to Romans 8.3 where it says, God sent forth his son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Now notice, it didn't say God sent his son in sinful flesh because Jesus' human nature was sinless. He was absolutely pure. Why then does Paul say, God sent his son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Why? Because if you saw Jesus standing in front of you, all you saw was a mere flesh and blood human being. You didn't see his divine glory, which signified he's God of the flesh. It was veiled. So looking at him, you think he's an ordinary man. Well, if he's an ordinary man, that means he's a sinner like me because all men sin. So physically, he looked like an ordinary human sinner. But don't let his physical appearance deceive you Though he's a man, he's a sinless man. He's unlike other men. That's why Paul says, in the likeness of sinful flesh. Hallelujah. Everyone got it? Where'd you go, brother? It's okay. I don't mind me taking the screen. Okay, now, do we have time to show it's Jesus or no? Absolutely, man. I mean, I, I was just hiding behind the scene, man. I want you to be in the front. I don't want people to pass out for my good looks. And then I'm going to have people propose it. All well, right. People are talking about the coffee behind you now, so that's that's the kind of distraction we're dealing with. The second time someone told me about the coffee, you want me to move the coffee? 
do talk about people with ADD. I thought I have ADD. You guys have mastered ADD. But anyway, now let's end it with the final part for part one because we got to do a part two, part three. Part one, Amen. we're going to end it because I'm not going to show you who was that son of man that Daniel saw, that no. divine figure who's God appearing as a man, who's distinct from the Ancient of Days, even though he's one with the Ancient of Days. They're two distinct persons on two different thrones, even though they're one God. And the Son of Man, who's an eternal king, whom all must worship as God. Who is it? Let's go to Mark 14, 61 and 62. Very good. Mark 14, 61 and 62. This is one of my favorite passages. Uh, verse uh, 61. Uh, Jesus during the trial, folks. But he kept silent and did not answer. Again, the high priest was questioning him and saying to him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? And Jesus said, I am, and you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. So what did Jesus say he is? I am the Christ, the Son of the Blessed, and I am that Son of Man who rides the clouds of heaven, who sits at the right hand of power. So Jesus just claimed to be the Son of Man that Daniel saw, who rides the clouds of heaven and sits at the right hand of power of God. That's who Jesus just claimed to be. I am that son of man. So when he claimed to be that son of man, Jesus is claiming to be that God who became man, who became flesh, who rides the clouds of heaven, which God rides the clouds of heaven, whom all nations must serve and worship the way they serve and worship God forever and ever. And to prove to you that Jesus is that son of man in heaven, Acts 7, 55 to 56. And in part two, God willing, Lord willing, part, part two, we're going to go much more deeper in Jesus being the Son of Man in response to heretics like Shabir Ali. Now let's go to Acts 7, 55 to 56. All right, 55, 56, the uh, stoning of uh, Stephen, yep. 55. But being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed intently into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God so who's standing? Jesus. So notice, Stephen filled the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit allowed Stephen to see heaven, and he sees Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Now notice 56, what Stephen says. All right, 56. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened up, and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Notice in verse 55, it says, Stephen filled the Holy Spirit, was allowed to see the veil of heaven removed, and he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God. But then Stephen says, Behold, I see the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. So Jesus is the Son of Man who is seated at God's right hand. He is the Son of Man of Daniel. Now, you remember what I said about the Lord? I said, The Lord wears light as a garment. Garment. His garment is light. His clothing is light. He puts on light like clothing. And he's the one who makes the cloud his chariot. You remember that? So the Lord God dwells in light, wears light as clothing, and the cloud is the chariot of his feet, right? You guys caught that? Because now Amen. let's see where does Jesus dwell in? Acts 9, verses 1 to 9, but we're going to break it down. Acts 9, verses 1 to 5, and then 6 to 9. Acts 9, verses 1 to 9. We're going to read the first five verses, then 6 to 9, and we're going to wrap it up. Watch here. All right, that's Acts chapter 9, verse 1, and we're going to read all the way to 9. Um, now, Saul, still breathing threats and, and uh, murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he was traveling... It happened that he was approaching Damascus and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Verse 5, and he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Did you catch it? A light flashed at noon when the sun is at its brightest. This light was so bright, it drowned the sun. And that light knocked Saul down and blinded him. And who was in the light? Jesus of Nazareth. 
So Jesus clothes himself with light as he's at the right hand of God and rides the clouds of heaven like God because he's God in the flesh, the divine son of man of Daniel. Now read 6 to 9. Dan Acts 9, verses 6 to 9. Now read the rest and we're done. All right. Now 6, verse 6. But uh, basically, uh, but get up and enter the city and it will be told you what you must do. The men who traveled with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. And leading him by the hand, they brought him into Damascus, and he was three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now, guys, pay attention to what you just read. Jesus manifested the glorious light that he dwells in, that he clothes himself with, a light that knocked Saul down, blinded him. And then Saul heard a voice audibly, and the people around them heard the voice audibly, but they were speaking Aramaic. If you go to Acts 22, Acts 26, when you get a chance, read Acts 22, Acts 26, where Paul again recounts his experience with the Lord. He says, they couldn't understand because he was speaking Aramaic to me, which means the people with him, couldn't understand Aramaic. The light of Jesus blinded him for three days. Now, here's what's astonishing. We'll unpack it later because I got to wrap it up. If you read Acts 9, it says that then Jesus appeared to Ananias and he told Ananias to go where? Go to a, a street, a straight street, straight right. street. Okay. And Saul is lodging with a person on a street called straight. So notice straight street. The straight path to God. Muslims day and night ask Allah to guide them on Sirat al-Mustaqim, the straight path. And yet Jesus is showing you to be on the straight path is the path that leads to me as your God and Savior. That's the first point I want you to catch. Notice he was blinded three days. And it was only three days later when Ananias laid hands on him that Saul's eyes opened because it was three days later that he was made alive and his spiritual blindness was removed because three days later is when he heard the gospel from Ananias, got baptized, called on Jesus' name, and he came to life on the third day. Sound familiar? Third day, he came to spiritual life, and he could spiritually see on the third day. Wow. That's all in Acts 9. But notice again how Jesus is being described as God. He's clothed with light. Psalm 104, 2 says, Jehovah is clothed with light. Jesus is the son of man who rides the clouds of heaven that Daniel saw, who reigns forever and whom all nations must worship as God. Jehovah rides the clouds of heaven. Everything that Jehovah God does, Jesus does and is because he's God in the flesh, distinct from the Father and the Spirit. Now to answer one question, why is it Saul said, who are you, Lord? Didn't he know he's the Lord? Because he said, who are you, Lord? Now, let me answer the question. Why did Saul say, who are you, when he called him Lord? So he knew it's the Lord. Because from Saul's Jewish training, being a disciple of Gamliel, the son of Hillel, one of the greatest rabbis who ever lived, the Jews were taught that not only does God dwell in light and that the light of God can manifest, but if you hear a voice from heaven, don't take my word for it. Do a research on this. It's called Bat Kol, the daughter of a voice. Jews believe that you could hear the voice of God from heaven and that God dwells in light. So notice, Saul from his Jewish training saw light from heaven, signifying this is the light of God, knocked him down, and he heard a voice. So his Jewish training taught him that's God speaking to you. But if it's God speaking to me, why is God saying I'm persecuting him? I'm actually doing his work, imprisoning blasphemers who blaspheme him. So he knew this is God, but he's baffled. Why is God saying, I'm persecuting him? So he says, Lord, who really are you? Who are you really? I thought I knew you, but it turns out I'm not because you're saying I'm against you. And this is where his world was turned upside down. When the words that came after was uttered, then Saul was rocked to the core as being because he says, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Wow. You mean the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is you? 
you, Jesus, are the God of Israel. The God of my father has become flesh. That means I didn't really know who you were because I thought I knew God, but it turns out you are the God of my ancestors whom I'm persecuting. That's what happened. Anyway, that's it. We're Amen. Done. Amen. Great teaching as always, brother. So um, uh, we, you and I will discuss the, the part two and uh, we'll continue with that. And of course, the most important part after we conclude this is the objection uh, you know, side and how we can refute it. So brother, are you doing any live streams today? It depends. I, I want to, I've been asked to do a series of responses to a debate that took place in the nineties, Hubs Abdul Malik, Salvation, the Bible, and the Quran, where he spent 95% of his time butchering the Bible. So I'm going to do a thorough response by the grace of Jesus Christ. I don't know when, maybe an hour from now, two hours from now, or it probably is going to be a late nighter. If it's a late nighter, I'm going to do it at 1 a.m. Eastern standard time, but look for the announcement. God willing, I'll be back. I have to take care of a few errands until then. But do pray for us, him and I, for our families, our children. Pray for my daughters and their mother that if she just gets restored to Jesus, I'll have my daughters again. Pray for that miracle that I have my daughters permanently and raise them and love them and put them to sleep. Pray for their health and mine. Pray for our provision that God will continue to support us to do the work until he calls us home. And pray that we're in love with Jesus and grow more in love with Jesus. And our knowledge will increase of his word for the glory of Jesus. Amen. Amen, uh, everyone. And and by the way, Sam, I don't know if you're aware of this. Uh, Gina A is saying that Shabir took down his video in Genesis 3. Are you aware of that? When did he do that? I'm not so sure. But uh, it's no big deal. Even if he did, we do have a transcript of it. So uh, we're fine. Okay. Uh, as far as we're concerned, uh, we are not here just to pick on somebody. We are here to fix and correct wrong teachings. Uh, Shabir or no Shabir, we are focused on the scripture. So thanks, brother, for your time. Thank you, everyone, for, uh, for your time. Thank you for those who gave, and uh, thank you for the moderators. And we will definitely announce to you part two. And uh, next week, uh, I will be announcing also uh, the other live streams I'll be having. Thank you, everyone. God bless you. And Christ take care. is risen, and he's alive forevermore. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Take care.